Hi, welcome to my channel, Reader Woman. My name is Judy, let's talk books. Or to be in particular, I want to talk about Beautiful Exiles by Meg Waite Clayton. I don't have a physical version of it. I got to read this during the month of July uh, as a pre-release through Amazon. Um, and the reason I chose this one is because it is yet another retelling of um, Martha Gellhorn meeting Hemingway and their 10 tumultuous years together. So having just read Paula McLean's Love and Ruin, I couldn't resist. Let's see who did it better. <laughs> I was surprised. I am a McLean fan. I have read her Paris Wife and loved that very much. Um, I also read um, her book on Beryl Markham. I forgot the name of it. Oh, I got it. Circling the Sun. Yes, yeah, circling the sun. I am a Beryl Markham aficionado. I thought that it was interesting. I did not necessarily buy her complete version of who Beryl Markham was, but I had to appreciate her novel. So when I read Love and Ruin, I liked it. I thought the ending had some problems for me, but you know, overall, I thought she did a really good job. So when I started uh, Beautiful Exiles, I was kind of like, yeah, well, let's just see, Clayton, what you can do. I thought that she did a better job. Clayton. Um, she, her, her Martha Gelhorn just had an older voice from the very beginning. And let's face it, at that fateful meeting, uh, in Key West, in a Key West bar uh, between Martha Gellhorn, her mother and brother, and Ernest Hemingway. She was in her late 20s. She wasn't a young woman. I mean, she wasn't, a, you know, like a 20 year old. She had had a long love affair with a man that didn't work out. Um, you know, his wife refused to divorce him, so they were never able to get married. So she had a bit of notoriety about her um obviously seen some of the world um she was on the cusp of publishing her at least her second book uh you know not her first her second so she and she had been a journalist um she had uh been traveling around the u.s uh doing uh work during uh, the great depression interviewing um people who were affected by um, no money or resources uh, from the effects of the Great Depression. So, um, you know, I thought, yes, it's in hindsight, <laughs> I thought that McLean, the voice that she used for Martha Gellhorn was just too young. Uh, she was too, uh, too unsure of herself. Whereas uh, Meg Clayton used a tone of voice that of a woman who knew more of what she wanted and didn't want. And she, it was, she had good reason not to want to marry uh, Ernest Hemingway. And I thought that uh, Clayton did a really nice job <laughs> having a uh, uh, <laughs> Gellhorn's mother there trying to talk both of them out of getting married while they're in Idaho set to get it, the deed done. So um, I, I liked the person whom she created in this novel. I have to say I am not a um, expert. I've just read two novels and seen the movie. <laughs> Gellhorn and Hemingway. So my complete understanding of the two is not, you know, I have no real basis. I can't really say who was more realistic, or I can say who was more realistic, but I can't say who was truer to the real story. Um, but Clayton definitely had a harder edge. She, um, you know, showed some of the, you know, compromises the um, choices that you know perhaps Gellhorn really didn't want to make 
um, she also just showed more of the reality. You know, um, <laughs> I kind of felt with uh, the McLean that they met in Spain and then just never separated ever after. Well, in uh, Beautiful Exiles, you know, they were coming and going. They were trying to stay together, but I mean, it took a while for them to find Cuba together. Uh, where they were trying, where they were building a life together uh, in their beautiful, um, well, <laughs> always disintegrating <laughs> villa. Uh, but um, yeah, I I liked that aspect that it it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a smooth sailing at all. So uh, that was that was a nice change that Clayton created. Um. The other thing that she brought up that was definitely not brought up in the other novel uh, was sex. Sex in the sense that uh, Martha Gellhorn was not necessarily liking the sex she was having with Hemingway. She loved him. She admired him tremendously as an artist, but um, she just, you know, uh, she had some problems with sex. That is something I'd like to find out if that's true or not. But um, she made the point several times, a couple of times, that he, he liked to have sex a lot more than she did. She preferred the cuddling. Um, and uh, she felt that it was more expected of her uh, rather than something that she wanted to initiate. So, and that it was also a bone of contention in their relationship. So, once again, harder edges, you know, more friction. Uh, then there was also a bit of um, domestic violence that uh, she brought up, brought up um, I found interesting. Um, you know, Hemingway hit Gellhorn um, out of frustration and anger. Um, she, there was at least one time that she hit him. Um, you could really see, though, uh, particularly when you look at Hemingway and his, his life trajectory, it wasn't up. <laughs> you know, this is a man who uh, had a huge alcohol problem and also uh, was, um, you know, had mental health issues. So, you know, his, his trajectory was going more downward and, um, you know, I can only imagine um, how he was, um, you know, affected. And I don't think particularly at that time, um, hitting, hitting a woman would not have been considered totally taboo. Nothing like that. Either the sex or the violence was mentioned in the um, Paula McLean book. Um, I thought that Clayton did a really good job of making me understand how much um, the relationship for Gelhorn was based on the idea that they would continue their working, working, loving, you know, all-encompassing relationship um, that started there in the Spanish War. She may have made her own way there, but once she was in Madrid, um, the, he, the two of them went and did a lot together. Um, they weren't necessarily writing the same articles, they were each doing their own thing, but um, they were spending a lot of time together. And they were both really conscious of the fact that they needed to uh, bring attention uh, to the world, that uh, Spain was fighting fascism on European soil, needed help, money, and resources to uh, fight it continue this war and both with the movie they were making uh, or that was being made uh, that they were helping support um, along with other things uh, they were both really committed to um, trying to help the Spanish uh, I thought that um, where Clayton really won out was that was how Gellhorn wanted to see their future together um, she really did think um, that they would go off to World War II and as journalists together and continue their adventure working and writing together. Um, 
unfortunately uh, her her desire her continuation of her career uh, was not his and uh, and so um, but that you know when you start off one way and then basically are ending up another um, obviously huge reason why the marriage didn't work um, I uh, really liked how um, Clayton uh, put in harder edges um, didn't you know sugarcoat things I think as much as McLean did um, it wasn't just you know one straight line <laughs> from Spain to Cuba you know there were many trips there were many uh, obstacles there were things you know being people being pushed and pulled all different directions and and it, it you know it took quite a bit of work on both their parts to actually find themselves in Cuba in the 30s um, I uh, you know the ending of course um, the same in the sense that um, Hemingway uh, towards the end of the European uh, going towards um, the invasion of Normandy um, Galhorn is back in Cuba and she is trying to encourage him to come out with her and you know write journalistic journalism pieces um, on the same subject and for them to come go back out there and do it again and then Hemingway takes her job, uh, gets Collier's, uh, her magazine that she'd been working for for umpteen years to give him the job of journalism. He takes the last plane seat out of New York for London and leaves her to follow on her own yet again, but this time on a ship that was carrying explosives. You can't, don't get much more ungallant than that, particularly when this is your wife. Um, and so that final fuck you that he gives her, um, Clayton, I thought, did a really good job. She, you know, Gellhorn had been working hard to try to get him to come to Europe and cover this war with her. Why not, why not see if Collier's can give you another job or, you know, and so ultimately that complete sense of treachery on Hemingway part, Hemingway's part was in some way created by herself. And she recognizes that in, um, Beautiful Exiles, the Martha Gellhorn character. She realizes that some of this came from her, which I thought was well done. Um, unlike with Love and Ruin, where there was no, it was just all him doing terrible things to her. And uh, so I thought it was a lot more reasonable uh, depiction of that final treachery. Now, one thing, neither book, which I, when I went to look on the Wikipedia page about Martha Gellhorn, um, she did have an affair during uh, World War II while she was still married to Hemingway. Uh, neither author dealt with that at all. Um, a little sanitizing. Uh, you know, I felt that Clayton was doing such a good job of writing the whole woman. I kind of hoped that it was going to be in there, but I, I most certainly didn't see it. Um, you know, I definitely recommend it. I don't know enough about the reality, and I am going to have to read a good biography about Martha Gellhorn now. Um, but I do highly recommend um, Beautiful Exiles. If you get a chance to read it, I would pick that one over Love and Ruin. So, anyways, we've had a good discussion about books. And I hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you later. Bye.